Well, thank you, Beth, and thank you uh, for being here this morning. Um, I come from the field of law, and oh, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, I come from the field of law, and I was asked to speak about the implications for law of uh, evolutionary theory and behavioral research uh, pursuing that theory, uh, and to at least introduce that topic uh, to you at this conference. Uh, there are several good examples of work in the law pursuing uh, evolutionary theory and behavioral biology research. Uh, for example, there's been some very good work done around the incident of child, incidents of child maltreatment uh, and the risk posed specifically by step parents. Uh, very rich uh, literature developing in that area. Uh, another area that has been developed is that of rape. Uh, and the idea that it is not simply uh, about aggression and violence, as many legal theorists have posited, but rather uh, there is a sexual aspect to it that is significant and has implications for penalties and treatment in that area. Uh, and another, a third area that has been pursued uh, quite uh, extensively is that in the employment discrimination area and using evolutionary theory on coalition building and the policing of sexual boundaries to help courts um, and other legal decision makers determine when discrimination is in the magic words in the law because of sex. Uh, and so that has been enlightening in that area. Um, so there are several good examples, but um, I, I struggle to fit kind of what's going on in this field to the, what is the topic of this conference and wanted to talk, uh, chose to talk about foster care, uh, the foster care area because uh, frankly, first of all, that's the area I'm most familiar with and that I do my work in, um, but also because there is a health aspect to this work. Um, it, in terms of uh, what I'll be talking about, a lot about grandparent investment, uh, and, and you'll see why that's relevant to this, uh, but grandparent investment studies that look at nutrition and mortality uh, of children in the ancestral past and some in contemporary societies, and that is, is relevant in this area. Um, there's also certainly a legal aspect um, to the work uh, in this area around foster care, and specifically, uh, the federal law has strongly favored placement of children with kin. Uh, that is a strong trend over the last uh, decade or two, uh, and the law, the federal law, uh, expressly incorporates that, requiring child welfare agencies to seek out relatives of children uh, being placed in foster care, first of all, and then to offer them opportunities and support to serve as foster parents. Uh, and so the law at the federal level has certainly um, done that and driven the states to do that too. And I can certainly give you concrete examples of legal um, uh, provisions uh, that do this, but um, I want to move into kind of the research that supports or doesn't support uh, that move. Um, and uh, just some background facts as we get into this, and I'm going to get into the theory and the research, but you should know that now in many large urban child welfare systems, over 50% of the placements of, kin of foster care placements are with kin. So it is something that has really taken over uh, the field. Uh, and you should also realize as background that there are still a lot of doubts about this. If you talk to caseworkers in the field, they're very nervous about this trend because the idea is that, look, we just took this child away from a dysfunctional family situation and now the law, the courts are placing this child right back into that situation. Yes, extended family, but still in the minds of many, uh, a dangerous situation, uh, posing a lot of risk. Uh, and you should also realize, final background point, that these decisions about foster care placement are made in a rather chaotic environment. Caseworkers have to move fast, there's a shortage of time and there's a shortage of resources. Oftentimes it boils down to, I've just gotta find a bed for this child right now. Uh, and whatever is open that's minimally acceptable uh, will work. And so the risk is high in this environment of exposing children to maltreatment and further damage. Uh, and so any tools that we can give to caseworkers in this situation are gonna be beneficial. Um, okay, so that's the background. Now let me start talking about or introduce you to kind of the evolutionary concepts and the behavioral biology research on kinship um, that is gaining attention from social work researchers in this field and legal uh, scholars. 
Um, the idea is that this research, this theoretical research, may help generate knowledge that supports more sophisticated foster care placement uh, policies and practices. So the concepts allow for the formulation of two uh, testable hypotheses that may help alleviate concerns uh, about and improve practice surrounding kinship foster care placements. And the first hypothesis is that on average, children are likely to experience better treatment and outcomes in kinship foster care as opposed to non-kin foster care. And there are two basic be behavioral biology concepts that allow for the formulation of this hypothesis that I just want to describe briefly. The first is the concept of degree of relatedness. Now this is often described through the idea of shared genes, that two individuals share genes um, and therefore there's this degree of relatedness. It's more accurate to talk about the probability of sharing a specific genetic segment or allele. Uh, and that's what degree of relatedness is really about. Uh, and I can chart the probabilities by degree of relatedness uh, as shown here. Uh, for first degree kin, for instance, your child or your sibling, the probability is that you share 50, per, there's a 50% probability that you share a specific genetic segment uh, with that individual. Uh, for second degree kin, as you can see, grandparents or nieces and nephews, 25% probability. And you see it go down the list as you get further away in terms of degree of relatedness. Finally, with non-kin, unrelated individual, virtually a 0% probability of a sharing of a specific genetic segment. Now related to that concept, the degree of relatedness, is the concept of inclusive fitness. And from an evolutionary perspective, individuals benefit not only from direct reproductive success, their own children, but also indirectly from the reproductive success of kin because of that probability of shared genetic material. Okay, so your child is likely to pass on, there's a prob high probability, 50%, that your child will pass on uh, your genetic material uh, in, in a specific segment. And you can use a simple equation to convey that concept. Um, here showing that, for instance, a mutation for kinship altruism will spread if the reproductive cost for the altruist is less than the reproductive benefit for the recipient of the altruism, discounted by the degree of relatedness, okay, that probability of sharing a specific genetic segment. Okay. And it turns out that this condition often existed within the ancestral evolutionary environment. And the result has been a spread, or was a spread, of a trait for kinship altruism, this behavioral tendency to favor kin. Now, both animal and human research has repeatedly found this differential kinship altruism Individuals tend to favor close kin, uh, especially with help related to evolutionary important matters, such as food provision, and for my talk, most importantly, childcare. Um, the conceptual result here is that higher levels of parental investment, uh, more childcare, more close supervision, less neglect, less abuse, are expected from close kin than from more distant kin, and certainly uh, from non-kin. Um, the empirical research addresses this first hypothesis specifically. Researchers have begun studies that compare kinship to non-kin foster care placements. Uh, and a comprehensive review published in 2004 revealed that despite kinship care homes receiving on average less financial support, uh, less training, less services, they're just, child welfare agencies just don't pay attention uh, to kinship placements uh, as much. There, but despite that, there was no evidence of worse child well-being or adult outcomes. Uh, and several studies indicated that kinship foster homes are superior in one important area, and that's placement stability. Okay? And placement stability is a proxy for good outcomes for children in foster care. Uh, and that is higher with kinship placements. One study showed that children in, in kinship foster care are three times less likely to have to move uh, from that placement. Uh, and more recent studies have confirmed this benefit of kinship placements. Uh, a very interesting study done recently by Gretchen Perry and Martin Daly, and those of you that are into the evolutionary psychology field will recognize the name Martin Daly, a, a leading researcher in the area. Uh, they used a data set from Ontario, Canada, 
and found that genetic kin placements were significantly more stable than both non-genetic kin placements and non-kin placements. Now, you may, if you're not in the field of child welfare, you may wonder, what's a non-genetic kin placement? Uh, well, because of the definition in the child welfare of kin, uh, to include both neighbors and friends that have a prior relationship with the child, there are non-genetic kin placements. And these research researchers, being evolutionary psychologists, drew the line for genetic kin placements versus non-genetic kin placements and non-kin placements uh, generally, and found that that line is the demarcation that really makes a difference in terms of placement stability. Uh, a Swedish study, a study using a data set from Sweden, made similar findings uh, previously. Uh, this research is a good start, but we need to be more, we need more sophisticated studies based on evolutionary concepts and detailed child outcome data, certainly more detailed than just placement stability, which again is, is a proxy for good outcomes, but not the outcomes themselves. Some recent research has begun to pursue this line of inquiry. Uh, for example, David Rubin and his colleagues in Philadelphia using the National Study on Child and Adolescent Well-Being, the NASCAR data set that many of you may know, uh, compared kinship placements with non-kin placements in terms of behavioral well-being uh, measures and found that children placed in kinship care exhibited a higher level of mental health and well-being. Uh, Melissa Dolan and her colleagues also used the NASCAR data set and they compared parenting provided by grandmothers to that provided by non-kin foster parents and found that grandmothers had significantly better parenting scores. Um, and we need to continue this type of examination and we need to examine the differences among types of kin is what the evolutionary theory uh, would tell us. Uh, we, don't, we need to move away from simple comparisons of this bimodal kind of comparison of all kin versus all non-kin and look within the kin category. Um, Perry and Daly began this, as I mentioned, by separating genetic kin from non-genetic kin. Uh, but there are distinctions to be made among genetic kin that need to be explored, uh, as I will explain. One study of note goes in this direction, examining the degree of genetic relationship within kinship placements. Um, and it was actually, just to mention, a byproduct of a study that was looking at differences in terms of legal options for permanency. In other words, if a child is adopted or if there's a permanent guardianship or a permanent foster care placement, does that make a difference, the legal category that the child is put in? Um, and Mark Testa, the child welfare researcher who did this work, um, also decided just to compare degrees of relatedness, uh, type of kin, as kind of a side um, sort of inquiry. What he found is that there were no significant differences in terms of the legal options. Uh, the children in adoption did the same as children in guardianship and that kind of thing. No significant differences. The only significant differences in his study were by degree of relatedness. So as to intent to raise a child to adulthood, grandparents and aunts and uncles were significantly more likely than other relatives uh, who were significantly more likely than non-relatives uh, to raise the foster child to adulthood. So Testa's findings concerning the significant effects of the degree of relatedness on the caregiver-child relationship justify an inquiry concerning distinctions among genetic kin not simply this bimodal inquiry, again, uh, with kin versus non-kin. And Andrew Zinn, a scholar at the University of Chicago's Chapin Hall uh, Research Center on Child Welfare, has begun this type of examination, and it's been very interesting, through sophisticated cluster analysis. He has identified four distinct types of kin placement with the degree to which the kinship parents are related to the foster child in their care being one of two primary indicators of kinship caregiver competence. Uh, the other one is the number and age of non-foster children in the home. Uh, but the degree of relationship is, again, one of these two primary indicators. And his first study using the four kinship types has found significant differences uh, in terms of the timing and disposition of children's placement outcomes. So do they disrupt? Do they reunify with their parents? Do they get adopted? Uh, the differences among these groups are significant, and again, one of the key predictors is the degree of relationship. Um, so it's starting to happen, this research in this area, but behavioral biology concepts suggest that more complex distinctions among kin exist, 
and we could use uh, and we could use this to further research in this area. Now, evolutionary concepts allow one to formulate a second hypothesis based on what I've been talking about, and that namely is that children in kinship foster care are likely to experience, on average, better treatment and outcomes when placed with some types of kin rather than others. And to be more specific, two additional behavioral biology concepts allow for the formulation of the second hypothesis, uh, in addition to a degree of relatedness and inclusive fitness uh, that I've already described. The first is the concept of paternity certainty or the laterality effect. The starting point here is that there is a difference in certainty of biological relationship to a child for men and women. Women being virtually 100% certain that the child they care for is their child, uh, men not. Uh, that there is a degree of, of risk of providing care to a child who is not bi biologically related to them. Uh, evolutionary uh, researchers have done some interesting work on this and, and the finding is uh, that back in the, environment, in the evolutionary environment, the error rate, so to speak, was about 10 to 15%. Current uh, cultural situation, it ranges from three to 7% if you look in the literature, but there is this degree of risk for men that women don't face. So the patrilineal line is less certain. And that has implications for extended kin relations, for example, um, Steve Gollin has said, and I, I've done a chart, it's rudimentary, it's show my PowerPoint skills, but um, this, I, this captures what uh, Steve Gollin says, uh, and I'll quote from him says that reduced paternity certainty decreases the, the probability of genetic relatedness in a way that compounds multiplicatively over kinship links through males. Thus, if under a given mating regime, a man has a paternity certainty of 80%, he has a grand paternity certainty through his wife's sons of 64%, but, but a corresponding grand paternity certainty through his wife, wife's daughters of 80%. And the conceptual result here is that a grandparent is expected to favor daughter's children over son's children uh, on average. Uh, there's just a more certain biological relationship there. Uh, and more generally, patrilineal kin are expected to receive less favorable treatment. Uh, this is the laterality effect. The second additional concept here uh, in play for this second hypothesis that I showed is the sex effect. Uh, behavioral tendencies related to childcare are expected to differ between men and women. Uh, women have a higher biological stake in each child with a significant biological and time investment in contrast to men. Just take pregnancy, for example. A woman is committed for nine months, um, a man not. Uh, and so the theory here is that women have developed a tendency to invest more in their children. Uh, men have a higher stake, on the other hand, in mating efforts that uh, they have the option to move on quickly, unfettered, uh, and they have developed a tendency to invest less in childcare, more in mating effort. That's the evolutionary theory of the sex effect. And the conceptual result, um, because this has, also has impacts uh, in terms of behavior to ex of extended kin, is that women tend to invest more in kin than men. All right, now I wanna talk about the empirical research that kind of puts these theories to test, this laterality effect, the sex effect. And there's been this very interesting, and this is the core of my talk here for this conference, interesting set, set of studies of grand parental investment. And the, there are two lines within this set. The first line I think is the most interesting here uh, today, and that's the historical population studies using village registries uh, from the past. And there are a series of studies that have focused on child nutrition and mortality. Uh, for example, there was a study done with a registry from a village in central Japan from 1671 to 1871. And the researchers studied the effects of grandparental presence on the probability of a child's death. In this society, a child was 35% less likely to die if maternal, grandparent, uh, maternal grandmother was present in the household. Presence of the paternal grandmother in both types of grandfather actually increased the likelihood of death. Uh, another study uh, was of a German village from 1720 to 1784. Here the researchers studied the effects of a grandparent being alive, simply alive at the child's birth on the probability of the child's death. 
And the researchers found that there was a 1.8 times greater risk of early child death if maternal grandmother is not alive at the child's birth. Um, other grandparents did not reduce the risk of death, with the paternal grandmother actually increasing the risk during the first month of life. Another study from an English village in 1770 to 1861 found that children were 1.9 times more likely to die before age five than their maternal grandmother had died before they were born. Uh, other grandparents had no effect on early death. A little more contemporary study looking at two villages in rural Gambia from 1950 to 1970 studied weight and height gain along with mortality during the first five years of life, uh, finding that maternal grandmother was the only kin member to have a consistent positive effect. Other grandparents had no significant effect. Um, and it's interesting to note in this study, maternal grandmothers uh, who were still reproductively active had a somewhat less positive effect. So the highest investment grandmother is a maternal grandmother who is beyond the year of, years of reproductive activity. Um, and finally there that I'll talk about uh, for examples is a contemporary study from rural Ethiopia uh, that looked at the effect of kin on child survival and growth. Um, and grandmothers, especially maternal grandmothers, gave a, have a positive effect on child survival, while paternal grandmothers may elevate a male grandchild's risk of death. Uh, so grandsons had a higher risk of death uh, with a paternal grandmother. As for growth in terms of height and weight, maternal grandmothers have a positive effect for both, while paternal grandmothers have a mixed effect uh, positive for height, but negative for weight um, of grandsons. Um, just as a side point, it's interesting to note these findings uh, may support some new research on the effect of the X chromosome, which is passed only from grandmothers to granddaughters. Um, it, it shows that the research in this area goes on, new theory here. Uh, one of the strongest predictions of this new theory is that paternal grandmothers may harm grandsons in favor of granddaughters. Um, and several recent studies have supported this theory. Um, so again, the research goes on. But two recent comprehensive reviews of these population studies have been completed. Uh, the first by researchers Sear and Mace. Uh, they conclude that 45 studies of whether the presence of kin affects child survival rates indicate that maternal grandmothers have a more variable effect, or more um, favor, indicate that maternal grandmothers have a consistent beneficial effect while well, paternal grandmothers have a more variable effect. Um, they can be beneficial or harmful. Grandfathers do not appear to affect child survival across studies. Um, in contrast, Strassman and Gerard's meta-analysis of 17 studies that was conducted in response to Sear and Mace, uh, their work uh, finds support for both maternal grandparents, both grandmother and grandfather having beneficial effects, while both paternal grandparents had negative effects. Um, the debate in the research in this area uh, continues, but in summary, uh, for our purposes here today, maternal grandmothers have a significant positive effect in terms of child nutrition and survival. There's no positive effect, it seems, from other grandparents, uh, possibly negative. Um, the mechanisms are unclear. These are looking at past data from, again, village registries. Uh, and what we need to do to take the next step, I think, is do some observational studies of grandparent-grandchild relations. But there is another line of research in the grandparent investment area that is interesting, and it uses contemporary subjects. Um, who do they use, at least at the start of this line of studies? Undergrad students. Uh, why? Because psychologists, it seems, always use undergrads. They're kind of captive, and they're there, and, you know, convincible, that kind of thing. Um, and Decay did the first major study using US undergraduates. Euler and Weitzel did a study using German young adults. Both studies asked participants to rate the involvement of, their grand, of each of their grandparents through age seven in four areas. Uh, time invested, knowledge that they conveyed, gifts that they provided, and emotional closest, closeness that they established. And the results here confirm the laterality effect. Um, and you can say their results produce a rank listing of grandparents with maternal grand grandmothers expected to uh, invest the most, followed by maternal grandfathers, paternal grandmothers next, and, and last, paternal grandfathers, with each category having a statistically significant difference um, in, in terms of investment. Uh, and these results have been replicated in subsequent studies. 
They're robust, even if you control for distance between grandparent and grand, uh, uh, grandchild, uh, level of education of grandparent and many other factors, uh, these results um, um, continue. Uh, and two recent studies of note have used especially extensive data sets moving well beyond the use of undergraduates. Uh, Daniels Baca used data from 13 European nations via the Multinational Survey of Health, Aging, and Retirement in Europe uh, and found the same results. Uh, Pollitt used a population of over 7,000 from the United Kingdom and found significant differences be between maternal and paternal grandparents in terms of frequencies of contact with their newborn grandchildren while controlling for a wide range of other variables. They also found that maternal grandparents provided a significantly wider range of financial benefits. There have been other studies that have followed up on the grandparent studies that I'll just mention real briefly. Study of aunts and uncles, uh, again confirming the sex effect and the laterality effect. Uh, here, um, this, this was done with, this is a study that was done with undergraduate students. Um, but you see the sex effect um, coming out, ants tending to invest more than uncles, and the laterality effect, matrilateral ants tending to invest more than patrilateral ants, and the same for uncles. Um, and these results have been replicated in subsequent studies also. Uh, and finally, evolutionary researchers have been looking at cousins, uh, which is a little different. The degree of relatedness is less here. We're talking third degree kin, and we're talking at the same generation but yet the laterality effect appears again from these results as you have more uncertain links uh, through paternity uncertainty, you get less um, investment. Um, so the summary in this area, the research identifies behavioral tendencies that are present in the absence of conscious awareness, understanding, or calculation of biological relatedness. I wanna be clear on that. It's not like grandparents sit around and think, you know, this is my son. I'm not so sure if that's my grandchild. I, I think I'll invest more in my daughter's children. No, it's not going on consciously. It's a, again, through evolutionary time, this behavioral tendency has become, it's unconscious and it's become part of, of human behavior is the theory. Um, and the research is backing that up. So it looks like from the research, there is this behavioral tendency to favor kin over non-kin in terms of altruistic behavior namely childcare, and as to kin, women invest more than men, the sex effect, and matrilineal kin invest more than patrilineal kin, the laterality effect. Now, <clears throat> the research on discrimination among kin does allow one to develop a ranked listing of second degree kin, which has been done in the literature, um, and this is the ranked listing by putting all these effects that I've talked about and even some others together, uh, you'd expect maternal grandmother to invest at the highest level among second degree kin. These are all second degree kin here with paternal grandfather expected to invest the least. And we can use this rank listing to establish a research agenda, which is starting to happen in this area. Uh, it provides the foundation for the formulation of useful, testable hypotheses. Uh, for example, we could examine whether child well-being measures such as attachment, health, uh, school performance, delinquency, um, and adult outcome measures, such as level of education attained, employment, mental health, uh, involvement in the criminal justice system, uh, whether those outcomes are better on average for children placed with maternal grandmothers than for children placed with paternal grandmothers. Um, and my colleagues and I at the University of Pittsburgh have conducted a pilot study using the Allegheny County, which is the Pittsburgh Area Department of Human Services data set. It's an administrative data set. It's quite limited. Uh, but I just want to talk you through that um, research and then uh, leave some time for questions. Um, our, our data set, a total data set, uh, is, comes as follows. We looked at all children uh, born uh, between uh, 1985 and 1994 who had involvement in the child welfare system in our county. Uh, this was our data, so it was rather large, over 42,000 children. You can see the gender and race breakdown. Uh, we followed these children through June 2008 when their average age was 18.2 years. We used this total data set to create two data sets that we then did our analysis on. Um, the first being the placement data set, and we had over 7,000 children within our uh, total data uh, set that had been placed in foster or kinship care. 
You can see the race breakdown. By the way, interesting to note, look at the racial difference here from the previous group. You see that black children are um, placed at 44% up to 65% at a much higher rate than other children. Uh, and that's true across the child welfare system, so just a side note. But in our data set, we had a non-kin placement group of over 4,000 children. These were children that were only in non-kin foster placements. The kin placement group, on the other hand, was almost 3,000 children who experienced at least one kinship placement. Uh, so that was our first data set that we developed. The second one eh, is very small, but the second one is a kinship care agency data set. This is a small data set, 367 children, um, where we knew what kind of kin they were placed with. We could determine that. It was the only, within our total data set, this was the only group we could do that. And you see most of them placed with second degree kin, grandparents, aunts and uncles, siblings, but, and unfortunately a small number in third degree kin, and then another number in non-genetic kin. Um, and we use that uh, to, again, test some of our hypotheses. Okay. Um, the results were underwhelming, I'll tell you right now. And, you know, just ruin the story, but um, this data set was so limited uh, that we didn't have um, uh, many surprising or, um, results that helped us in testing these hypotheses. First of all, as to, we only had four outcome measures in this administrative data set. When you do this work, you're limited by what you have. And we had mental health services, the level of mental health services, the level of drug and alcohol treatment services, whether the children were involved in the juvenile justice system, and whether they became involved in the adult criminal system. Those were our four outcomes. You can see that um, you know, we had, uh, let's see if I have the, okay, we, we only had significant differences uh, with the kinship foster children having less mental health services, thus we took that as a proxy, less mental health problems. But on the other hand, they had more drug and alcohol services, so more, more problems in that area. Juvenile justice and criminal justice, um, no significant differences uh, between the, the groups. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't really support the first hypothesis, although I should note the kinship children, the, the group that were in kinship care, were at higher risk. When you measure the factors that show children, the, the level of risk children face, the kinship group was at higher risk for a number of reasons, and I can explain that if you're interested later. Um, but yet they were coming out about equivalent. Uh, so, you know, not full support for the first hypothesis, but, but some maybe. We then did some regression analysis on juvenile justice involvement, and we found that the non-kin foster care placement, kin foster placement distinction did not predict juvenile justice um, placement. Other things did. Race sure does. That's the strongest predictor, um, <clears throat> but not the placement. And we did the same for jail, same thing. The placement did not predict um, but certainly involvement in juvenile justice predicts you going into the criminal justice system. And, and these are all typical and, and consistent with prior research, but for our purposes, um, again, underwhelming. Um, we also looked at just the number of placements, and we saw that actually the children that were in kinship placement early on had more moves, it was less stable. That is inconsistent with the prior research I described. That kind of shows that our local county has a problem with their kinship placement support and system. And that's another benefit of doing this research. We can tell the local authorities, look, you got a problem. And they were very interested in this. Uh, and so it was helpful to them uh, that we found this out. OK, so in the end, the findings fail to date, fail to fully support our first hypothesis. As I said, uh, we had largely equivalent outcomes across the placement types. Um, but we don't have much outcome data, and we certainly don't have data on parental investment levels. So, you know, more, more needs to be done. Um, and the findings um, as to the second hypothesis, we found no significant differences as to kinship type, um, all about equivalence. So a real failure to support the second hypothesis. I think the problem there is we need a larger population. So we continue to pursue, the, pursue this research. And so what is our next step? Well, we want to do a focused inquiry using large, detailed national data set. So we're going to use the National Survey of Child and Adolescent Well-Being, um, which is a very rich data set. It has over 5,000 children who became involved in the child welfare system during 1999 to 2000, uh, plus another 700 children that were in placement for at least 12 months at the start of the study. 
30% of them being in kinship placements. So this data set um, is quite extensive. It's also very rich in terms of parental investment measures and child outcome measures. Uh, and so we can use that data set, we hope, to compare maternal grandmothers to, the, to placements with paternal grandmothers. So we're going to see if those two placements, how they compare. Um, and the findings that we hope may support and justify primary data collection project designed to test these kinship care hypotheses that impact child health and well-being. And just to conclude, our ultimate goal here is to generate knowledge that may support more sophisticated foster care placement policies and practices, especially for caseworkers and judges who are caught in the trenches, like I said, in this chaotic environment. Um, and it's interesting uh, to note that researchers from the field of behavioral biology are becoming engaged in this specific inquiry. Again, Martin Daly, again, the leading figure in the evolutionary theory area, has recently authored a paper calling for further research in this specific area of foster care placement. Um, and so that adds, I think, intellectual ener energy and rigor to the inquiry. Uh, it's really an opportunity for sophisticated multidisciplinary research. Um, so that's where we are uh, with this. Um, and so this is my case study of impact, implications of behavioral biology research for the law, for guiding policy and law, uh, in this case, in the child welfare area. So I welcome your questions and thoughts, uh, comments, and thank you for listening. much. I, I'm a subscriber to this evolutionary psychology uh, blog, and it really makes me uh, question, uh, as this did, um, things that have to do with uh, uh, you know, these evolved uh, behaviors, mm -hmm. whether it's my re jealousy or anxiety with my marital relations or with my kids, uh, the fact that my kids are more related to me, and who the heck is my wife now that I have kids? And, right. and, and you know, as you were talking about, and I think you really hit the nail on the head, these are unconscious things that these people are doing. And when you talked about your objective in doing this study is really uh, to help positively influence the placement of these kids and, and the uh, practices by which they're, they're done. And I was wondering whether we're sophisticated enough as a society where your results can be actually explained to the foster parent. Uh, whether they're paternal or maternal, say, well, you know, you, you have the, st the, the deck stacked against you potentially as a paternal grandparent or, or, or vice versa. And this is something called inclusive fitness. And this is why maybe you should care that your genes are propagated through this line or whatever. Uh, so, you know, number one, ca ca can you actually educate, you know, the, these foster parents using your findings? And, and perhaps number two, um, with, uh, you know, the, the doubts that a paternal grandfather may have, uh, ca ca you know, is there room for uh, positive genetic testing that, yeah, this is my grandkid, 100% uh -huh. I, I know, yeah. you know? Yeah, Thanks. well, I don't know if that would help much because of the un unconscious uh, level of this, but um, yeah, that, that last point is interesting. I, you know, actually, the education point is a valid one. It's a very good concern to raise. Um, my focus, frankly, has been on educating caseworkers and judges, um, and I don't even know if I'm that hopeful there, let alone foster parents. Um, but the thought is, is that you're putting them on notice to kind of, it's playing the odds, right? The averages. Uh, it doesn't dictate that an individual is going to behave this way. But on average, it's true. And so if a caseworker or a judge knows about this, will know if they're dealing with a paternal relative, maybe the level of, maybe not stop the placement, but the level of support ought to be a little higher because the risk is higher. If you can educate the field that much, and I'm, you know, and certainly if you can try to educate the extended family that we're running maybe a higher risk, and that's why these services are being ordered for you, maybe that would be helpful. But I don't know if I need to, to lecture them on inclusive fitness theory, okay? But just that the risks are higher, okay? Yeah. Just yeah. for a second. Sure. Um, you're welcome to stay and ask questions as long as uh, David's willing to uh, entertain them, but I just wanted to give you the directions for lunch. Uh, there's going to be barbecue at the Harvard Law Lawn, and to get there, just go down the hallway, through the vendors, down the stairs, follow the signs, turn left, go through the student center, and then there will be a volunteer to direct you to basically just go down the, the pathway to the lawn, which will be on your left. So enjoy lunch. There. Hopefully the stampede will not take place too. <laughs> yes. Soon.
Um, I'm familiar with this work, and I think it's great to uh, understand the whole genetic structure, but I also think there's additional considerations that are just as evolutionary, and that has to do with cultural transmission. Mm. So clearly, mothers are going to have a stronger relationship with their own mothers than with the mothers of their husbands. And that's going to create a cultural transmission mechanism, yes. which in many ways, I think, provides an alternative set of hypotheses, which are not mutually exclusive. They just have to be considered together. There's also quite a lot of research done by uh, people like Deb Lieberman, for example, which show that the causal factor in whether you consider somebody a kin is co-residence. And so the yes. amount of time that you physically spend with someone is in a family is going to be very consequential regardless of what the actual uh, genetic relatedness is. And so yeah. it seems to me that a more fully rounded program that takes evolution into account is going to have to include, but also go beyond, these uh, narrow genetic considerations. And I'll just leave my, you, you can say what you like about that. Well, thank you, uh, David. I, you know, I, I agree with you completely, and, and more sophisticated research is being done in this area. I mean, there's been some work in, in societies that do have a patrilineal um, makeup, uh, you know, patril and that is indicating what you're indicating, that in, especially in rural Greek society, that you know, the paternal grandfather is an important, beneficial, high investor figure. So I think the cultural transmission aspect is there. Uh, and so we do need to be careful. It does need to be well-rounded. I completely agree with that. Um, and so so one practical consequence is, is that if you're gathering information, you can simply ask, who is this given person that needs to be placed in foster care? You know, who have they spent time time with? Yes, right. And that could be, and that could be information that you could factor in along with just the genetic, you know, the shared genes. Aspect. I agree, and that's where this non-genetic kin concept is not completely without merit at all. Right. And I don't mean to indicate that, although Perry and Daly's research is indicating that that's a, a marker. Um, but I think we do need to be more careful if we're going to bring this into the field. Oh, but yeah. it's great work for this to be applied. So congratulations well, on what well, you're thank doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, actually, I, I know nothing about this field at all, but I was going to ask a similar question, like you're citing data from, you know, 200 years ago when right. perhaps families were more localized and in modern days is that like a different relationship more important? So. Yeah, no, and I think that that more re research needs to be done. As I said, the next step is to do some observational studies where we can see the grandparent-grandchild interaction. This is what we have. You're raising valid concerns, um, and as the project goes on. Um, but hopefully we encourage that research. Um, and I think at some point it can be helpful to us in the field, frankly, in a field that needs help um, because things are so chaotic and unguided. Uh, whatever we can get to play the odds a little bit might be helpful, as long as it's carefully done. Um, I, and that's what I'm driving at. So. And how do you fund research like this? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's a lot of the reasons that you're using undergrad students for this work is because it's cheap, right? Uh, you don't need much. Um, there isn't a lot of, that I'm aware of, a lot of funders. Now, I come from the legal field, and we're not largely scurrying for grants, so I can't say that I've personally tried to raise a lot of money for this. But... The National Science Foundation has a law and social science um, division where you know we're hoping to apply to, but the story is is yet untold. Okay, thanks. Yep. Enjoyed your talk. Um, you didn't uh, get you didn't devote any time to talking about rape, which you had brought up previously, but yes. I sort of assumed that you're familiar with Randy Thornhill's oh, yes. work, mm -hmm. work and all that, and and maybe if. What were some, what are some of the policy implications for understanding this rape as sort of a sec, sexual strategy? Yeah, Owen Jones is a legal scholar that's used Thornhill's work uh, heavily, uh, and he's written a very good article on on kind of raising the points that you're raising or addressing the points that you're raising. Uh, one thing that he notes in terms of penalties imposed that maybe you know, chemical castration is something that we ought to look at seriously um, because there is this sexual aspect to this. It's not just about violence, um, you know, that kind of thing. So that's one implication. Um, but I really encourage you to read Owen Jones' work on rape if you really want to get the details on implications. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Hi. Hi. Um, the current research show, including my own research, 
that communal breeding is really important on the survivorship of children, particularly after about 12 years old. Mm. So not just the survivorship of infants, but the survivorship, which would be important to inclusive fitness to get your kid to adulthood. Mm -hmm. And one of the important factors that's shown there is it's not just the presence of one of these relatives, but it's the cumulative effect of the number of relatives. Right. I have a historic population where, in fact, survivorship of the completed family size is larger in communities where you simply have more relatives of the aunts, of the uncles, of the grandmas, of the grandpas. Um, and in fact, very significant was the husband's the, the dad's sister, because you yes. have the women, again, the cultural uh, effect of cultural uh, evolution, where you have the women who hang out together. So even though this woman is not related to this woman, it's her husband's sister, mm -hmm. but the children are related because they do so much together. Yeah. That, um, that what you see is this very important role of these women hanging out together and the fact that there are other kin around. Yeah, and, and late, you're right to raise the age issue. I mean, as children become older, that seems to be where the father's investment has the exactly, most effect. Uh, and also the extended family, as you're indicating, in a broader sense. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and that this field has lots of potential for research that has implications beyond what I gave you as an example here. And so I agree. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you.